The Colt 45s held spring training in the middle of nowhere in Arizona. Apache Junction, Arizona provides an excellent site for filming TV shoot 'em up, but it's also a splendid training ground for one of Major League Baseball's newest sports spectaculars, the Houston Colt 45. The next one I went to in 63 was Apache Junction. And there was a hotel, service station, and uh, that's about all. Stands Apache Junction, when they had to build a temporary stadium for spring training, and the Stamp players used to walk from the hotel to the ballpark and through the uh, through the prairie or through stand through the desert. Now Dick Farrell always carried a pistol with him, and they were shooting snakes, trying to catch snakes. And every day to spring training, you could hear them shooting all the way through there, all the way up to the ballpark. I never forget the day I loaned Dick Farrell, you know, my car, and then about four or five hours later, he finally brings it back. And where were you, Dick? And he went hunting up in the mountain with my car. You know, he got stuck somewhere. And the players sort of, sort of blended into the uh, to the old Western saloon kind of environment. But Mickey Herskowitz, who is another character in his in his own right, was a young beat writer for the Houston Post at that at that time. And uh, he uh, say he put together a collection of very memorable columns about training in Apache Junction. Colt Stadium amenities for the players were Spartan. Sure, it didn't have all the accommodation that you would see elsewhere that like you see now, especially. But at the same time, it was fun because you, everything was new. That new clubhouse was, might have been small, but it was new. Everything was new. We had a, a little building outside the uh, left field line that uh, had nothing but windows and big fans. No, no air conditioning at all. It was. It, it, a little tough after a Sunday afternoon game and going in there and sitting in that place, it was still just as hot in that dressing room as it was out on the field. One thing they did have was fancy western duds that Judge Hoffines made them wear on the road. The judge had a, a tailor made and we uh, had to go downtown, have them made, fitted. We had hats and boots, orange and uh, black boots. And everybody tried to leave their hat on the bus, and somebody would pick it up and bring it to you and said, I think you left this, but we had to wear them. We used to pass by the, at the airport, coming through the terminal, they all thought the rodeo was in town. We were going through the, ho the uh, airport in L.A. one night, and the lady stopped and said, or when are y'all going to be performing? She thought we were a cowboy band. Announcers for the Colt 45s came over from the minor league Houston Buffs. Well, you know, Gene Elson and Lowell Pass and how they presented the games, and, and it, it, they really got the fans involved, you know. Gene statistically knew everything about the game. I mean, he could quote anything that you want to know by the numbers. Ask a fan today what they recall from Colt Stadium, and you get two answers. The, uh, the stories are legendary about the mosquitoes and about the heat. And it was just hot, humid, stifling hot. I remember one Sunday they took about 37 people out of there and just had ambulances going from the ballpark to the, ho the hospital. Colt Stadium, which a lot of us called the skillet, because it was on a parking lot and had no shade protection whatsoever, was just unbearably hot. And the older players, I mean, they really got tired quickly. One of the great things that happened about that is Judge Hoffines convinced uh, the National League for us to play Sunday night games. And that was the first time a Sunday night game uh, had been played in baseball. And we played doubleheaders in those days too. And we played one doubleheader against the uh, Chicago Cubs and Ernie Banks was famous for his, his one line is, I feel great, let's play two. Well, so after the second game, uh, we were kidding him quite a bit and he said, you know, you can't play two in Houston. <laughs> Then there were the mosquitoes. And the thing I remember most about the Colt 45s, not so much, it, it didn't really have anything to do with the team. I mean, the players, it had to do with those awful big mosquitoes that were in the ballpark. The mosquito repellent didn't work very well out there. It seemed like every afternoon in those days, we had a little shower or something, and you got to the ballpark and the grass was wet, but the mosquitoes were everywhere. It was about the size of bats. <laughs> the kind with the long black wings, you know, that come in and haul you off through the skies. You know, they were terrible. I mean, and I had come from the north, and I'm down here in the middle of the summer in Houston, Texas, with these huge mosquitoes that are eating me up out at this rotten stadium. In the days we wore the, the inner socks with the white, the white inner socks, and when you get through playing, you look like you'd been through a briar patch. I mean, the, 
blood spots all over your socks. They sprayed a little bit, but they couldn't do anything with them. It was just out on that prairie out there in South Houston. See, see this woman looks like she had hair on her arms and they were just all mosquitoes. In. You had to go, you had to take mosquito repellent. For all of it, the 1962 expansion team could have been worse. The National League with the addition of the Mets and the Colt 45s had 10 clubs and we actually finished eighth. We beat the Cubs. The Cubs finished ninth and the Mets finished 10th. We won the first three games of the season and Judge Royal Hoffines was making World Series tickets. He thought that was it. He said we had this kind of franchise. A player's life in the early 1960s was far different than today. The minimum salary was $6,000. But we had a lot of fun and you couldn't spend a lot of money on the road. You get $10 a day meal money and and uh, you go to San Francisco and L.A., they'll eat that $10 up pretty quick. Well, I think what they get right now is probably our salaries on a per diem basis because it's a lot, you know, it's incredibly different. I had a good year in 62, and I went into Paul Richards, who was our general manager, and he said, uh, well, you had a pretty good year. He said, I'm going to give you a $5,000 raise. And I said, well, can we talk about that a little bit? And he said, yes, but the longer we talk, the more it goes down. So I asked, asked for the contract, signed it, and got out of there. <laughs> <laughs> you had no choice. And you know, in those days, uh, everybody had fun. Uh, and I think that was kind of the deal. It was kind of an honor to be able to, to make it to the, to the big leagues uh, and playing all your little league balls in high school and college and going through that. And that was the, the ultimate to be there. And the excitement of being a major league ball player overrides a lot of that stuff. And then you, have, you have to tell people that because they think it's not just those dollars. It's an incredible feeling that comes across. We always had roommates now today that some have single, they don't have any roommates at all. There's, each one has their own room and uh, then uh, the better ones have a suite. You cannot question the talent of today's players or any athlete of today. Uh, we did not work out. We had to go home after the season was over with and get a job. For Houston baseball fans 50 years ago, memories are good too. And you didn't care that it was out at Cold Stadium where there were mosquitoes and it was hot. and You didn't care. But to have a, a Major League Baseball team here in Houston, the Code 45, to go out and see Major League Baseball was phenomenal. Up next, Crosby, Texas.